Okay, it is 2.01, so we can go get started. So hello and welcome everyone to another MMS info session. As you know by now, these sessions are offered under the CMS Measures Management System contract, which is led by Battelle. I'm Brenna Rabel, and I oversee education and outreach on this project. Today's session is on overcoming common challenges in the measure development lifecycle, uh, and it's geared towards those of you who are looking to refine your expertise in quality measure development. We're joined today by two of my MMS colleagues, Dan Anderson and Mike Saka, uh, to share some insights from their experience developing measures and supporting measure developers. And we'll talk a bit more about their experience in a bit, but next slide, please. Okay. So these info sessions are part of an ongoing effort to engage measure developers and other stakeholders in quality measurement topics. Um, that's an effort that also includes a series of newsletters and bulletins along with special announcement emails, public webinars, and routine updates to the measures management system website. We're happy uh, to offer these on a monthly basis, and that's going to continue into the next option year of our contract, uh, so that we're going to continue to be able to provide up-to-date information on a wide range of topics related to quality measure development. So before we jump into the presentation, I just want to co cover uh, a couple of housekeeping items. The first is that today's session is being recorded. The second is that all participants are going to be muted during the call, but we will have an opportunity for Q&A at the end. Um, so you can be entering your questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom right hand side of your screen, um, either during the call or at the end. I'll read them aloud to our presenters to facilitate that discussion. Um, the presentation slides from today's session have been posted to the MMS website for your reference, and they'll be updated in a week or so with notes from today's session. Uh, there's also going to be a recording of today's presentation posted to the CMS YouTube page at a later date. And finally, please be sure to stay tuned after the Q&A today, as we have a few very exciting announcements to share that you won't want to miss. Uh, and with that, we can go to the next slide. Okay. So CFS established the measures management system as a way to help standardize a process for developing, implementing, and maintaining quality measures. Um, and you know, we're really focusing on the, the quality measurement part of this today. So there are a few key components to the measures management system that we um, always want folks to be aware of. You know, the first is that we create tools to assist in the development of quality measures. Those tools include the CMS measures inventory tool, the MMS blueprint, um, our website, and then a few other tools that are handy in helping with uh, doing environmental scanning and that sort of thing. And then the second key component is what we're doing right now, uh, which is engaging stakeholders. Um, and we strive to engage a wide variety of stakeholders, uh, such as patients, clinicians, clinical specialty societies, patient advocacy programs, and then of course, measure developers um, on how to get involved in the, CM, uh, in the CQM development process or on how to refine their skills in that area. And now Relay uh, is a small business partner that we work with on MMS, um, and they support us in several of these tasks, uh, which is where Mike and Dan are joining us from today. So with that, I'm going to ask that they uh, that we turn the uh, to the next slide, and then I'm going to hand the reins over to Dan Anderson. Uh, thanks, Brenna. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Great. Well, yeah, again, thanks, Brenna. I'm Dan Anderson. Uh, I first wanted to start off by thanking Mattel and CMS for the opportunity to present today. I also wanted to thank them for their inputs and guidance during the development of the slide deck, which you know, covers a lot of material. Um, as Brenna indicated, Rely Group has many years of experience in measure development and reporting. Um, our staff, subject matter experts, have decades of leading large-scale development efforts. So many of the challenges and mitigation strategies we're going to discuss today come from a lot of that direct experience, both in the public and private sector. Mike Saka and I are going to be doing some handoffs during the presentation. We uh, planned it so it won't be too jarring for you. Um, and we're really hopeful that this presentation, uh, considering the content, will lead to an active Q&A session. We've also asked another Rely colleague, Dr. Mike Rapp, to join us for Q&A. Many of you uh, may know Dr. Rapp from his time uh, while he was at CMS. Uh, next slide, please. So why are we talking today about common challenges in the measure life cycle? Well, first of all, as, as I'm sure you're uh, very aware, measure development is varied based on a number of factors. First, 
is the funding source. So at Rely specifically, we're typically funded by CMS to develop measures, and so therefore we're following a very specific process as laid out in the MMS blueprint and in accordance with our contract statements of work and schedules. But many of you develop measures outside of CMS programs, or at least without CMS programs as the main focus, at least initially. There are obviously specialty societies, associations, and registries that develop measures, and there are hybrid situations where these measures do also get adopted into CMS programs. This variety is a good thing that we all welcome, uh, but it also leads to a variety of ways to develop measures. There are also varied purposes for measures that we all face, uh, but, you know, such as you know, what are the measures intended for? Is it quality improvement specifically? Is it for value-based purchasing programs or CMS public reporting transparency programs? So regardless of the, the, the mechanism of funding or the intent, challenges can and do arise in the development process, and a lot can be shared and learned in the community. For instance, and something we'll talk about, a big challenge and lesson learned um, from our experiences developing measures and providing technical guidance to developers is the need to align and monitor the project plan and timeline for the key milestones in, during the life cycle, uh, and also look at you know, external dependencies, constraints, and timelines. These, obvious, these vary depending on the intended measure's purpose, the scope and use, but consideration has to be given to things um, like, at least in our world of CMS measures, you know, the associated draft and final rule requirements, the NQF endorsement cycles and processes, and other constraints. We'll discuss that in more detail shortly. This presentation is really focused on best practices. Uh, you know, we are aware that the, the audience here um, most, and most measure developers are doing a good job and are managing a complicated process that you know, can be inherently chaotic at times. So the goal of this presentation is um, really to just help present and consider some next level techniques in measure development. Before moving on, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to CMS. I mean, they, you know, uh, when I was at CMS and since leaving CMS, it's very obvious that they take this, the challenges of measure development seriously. Um, they put out resources in conjunction with Battelle to make our measure developer life cycle, you know, life's much easier, you know, the blueprint, uh, the measure development plan, CMIT, things like that are really there as guides and tools to help align and streamline the process. CMS also convenes stakeholder groups to evaluate the process um, and, and improve it. Another important tool for improving the measure development process for all is, is things like this, sharing lessons learned from various measure development efforts and different perspectives. These, these can help inform and drive the improvements and best practices, and that's what we're hopeful will occur today. Next slide. So I just want to level set a little bit about the scope of today's presentation. Um, you know, we determined that we couldn't really get into each phase of the life cycle and address all the challenges and opportunities that come with each. So we've intentionally focused on some of the earlier stages of the life cycle, from conceptualization through testing, as indicated in the graphic above. This is really just to be practical. There's plenty to talk about in other phases of the life cycle and throughout. I'll say that some challenges later in the life cycle do require some discussion as they can become challenges um, they can become challenges late in the development process if they're not adequately planned for early and a priori. So we'll be discussing some of those in the context of project planning and, and, and management in the coming slides as these aspects of the development process underpin the entire process. You're likely familiar with a version of this graphic. Um, notably missing here are some of the bars you normally see on the bottom which cross you know, the cross life cycle activities, including feasibility evaluation, information gathering, stakeholder engagement. And we'll touch on some of these in the presentation, but again, we're purposely limiting the scope to take a somewhat deeper dive into selected key areas. Also, some topics, um, notably missing like stakeholder engagement, that are obviously critical throughout the life cycle have been discussed on prior information sessions, so we decided not to address them on this call. So in the coming slides, we're going to transition to talking a little bit about the project project management as well as other general challenges outside of the outside of within the life cycle specific stages. Next slide. So in these next few slides, we discuss overarching challenges, including project planning and practical considerations. Again, these aren't specific to any one phase of the life cycle, but they're areas where challenges can and do occur and where we've gained some insights, often the painful way, on how to mitigate them. The first challenge I'm sure you're all aware of is that measure development is hard. I mean, let's face it, even, in the, even if the process itself was smooth and linear, say, like hypothetically, if you had a clear path to quantifying a, a known gap, stakeholders were all in agreement, and clean data were falling from the sky, there are still other factors that are often outside the control of the measure developer. 
These can include constraints both internal and external to your organization, as well as various competing timelines and stakeholders. So the first mitigation we offer is to take the long view, the long view by which we mean thoughtful, thoughtfully considering what it takes for end-to-end -end development. Especially, this is especially important in complex areas like patient reported outcome performance measures, pro -PMs, or digital measures. In taking the long view, you're ensuring that the project plan and planning efforts build in the extended time needed to deal with contingencies. For those of you who have developed measures, you know that contingencies are the rule. They're not the exception. So developers need to be thinking about later phases of the life cycle, such as implementation, even in the earlier stages, such as conceptualization. And that's not always easy or intuitive, we understand. On an upcoming slide, we're going to just show you an example of a process flow diagram. It, it'll provide a kind of a notional illustration of measure conceptualization, including the typical steps, artifacts, and handoffs involved to highlight, just to highlight the complexity and necessary inputs in just that one stage. For CMS-funded projects, the project plans and or the life cycle phases are dictated at least at a high level from the statement of work and scheduled deliverables, and again, the guiding documents such as the blueprint. However, we recommend that even for internally funded projects, developers should include a detailed project plan and a project management approach to avoid some of these pitfalls, pitfalls we're going to be discussing. To the, point of this, to the point of the second bullet, timelines and other constraints are often out of the measure developer's control or purview, and these may change from the time of the award or start of the measure development efforts. So staying on top of those external items and being in touch with the various entities we consider critically important. Just a couple quick asides on constraints and timelines. In the case of ECQMs, additional consideration has to be given and planned for in terms of evolving HL7 standards and requirement for technical specifications. You should also be considering the EHR vendors and their readiness to implement new or updated ECQMs. In the case of CMS program-specific development, such as the merit-based incentive payment system, or MIPS, within the broader context of the QPP, it's important to maintain a thorough understanding of the requirement of MIPS and CMS measurement priorities. And they, they can and do you know, evolve each year. <clears throat> Other examples of external constraints to keep in mind are the current evolving transition from the QDM SQL-based ECQMs to SQL QI Core Firebase ECQMs. Next slide, please. So we touched on some of this already, but varying measure types will have different planning and management needs. In the project, in, in the project planning, developers need to acknowledge the inherent clinical and technical workflow changes that are almost always needed. Current state feasibility for most de novo pro PMs, especially those that are ECQMs, are a real challenge. However, it's a known challenge going in, so the developer should have an eyes wide open approach and consider the likelihood of a longer development life cycle, given the current state will require some level of workflow and technical challenges technical changes, excuse me. This often requires open, transparent, and maybe a little difficult conversations with the customer, the leadership, or whatnot. But acknowledging and planning for these difficulties, that will you know, prevent real challenges later down the road and make the work smoother. Accessing good quality data, is sure it's a pain point for the, all of you with experience. Um, accessing good quality data that fits the measure need is a real problem. Project plans should include data identification, assessment, cleaning, analysis, and implementation throughout the entire life cycle. And that will require prospective test data once the workflow or technical changes have been made. Oftentimes, we, we, you know, we've seen um, people run into trouble when this is not considered in timeline or budgeting and planning. I know I've experienced that firsthand. When, when you're proposed, you know, when the proposed approach you're taking includes leveraging the health IT vendors and clinical facility or you know, practice sites um, to support the testing phases, the project plan needs to include timelines for the vendors, measure calculators, et cetera, that have all their own you know, internal timelines, dependencies, and approvals. So all of this underscores the need for open communication and coordination. This, that's going to be a theme across a lot of the challenges and solutions we'll talk about today. And <clears throat> I should also note that you know, there may be additional requirements and timeline considerations for any applicable ECQM annual update processes. While this typically is only after a measure is adopted or included in the CMS program, all ECQM developers should be familiar with that process and the requirements. The next slide, I think I'm handing it off to Mike. Hey, thanks, Dan. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I echo Dan's uh, appreciation and thanks for having the opportunity to talk to the group here. I think, um, as Dan alluded to, what you see on this slide is really um, it's not meant to be prescriptive, but we thought it might be helpful 
in trying to lay out from a measure conceptualization sort of point of view uh, the different phases within that or the different sort of activities and tasks typically that at least uh, we try to start with. And I always like to try to start that process by visualizing it using a Visio or a, a swim lane type approach here. So um, we've included this to really show, I think, the high level steps, some of the players and handoffs that are involved. Of course, um, as Dan alluded to, depending upon your funding source, your contractual specifics, or your grant uh, specifics, or if you're internally funding it, some of these things obviously might change or shift, but we thought it might be helpful to give, a, give the developers a little bit of a, a visual on that. Um, key components of this phase, how the proposed measures work through that process. Um, and I, and I think another point to, while we tag this project planning, this is obviously isn't a project plan, um, but another important point is that it, this is intended to help inform the project plan. The project plan would obviously build out the steps and things, but um, you know, we, we thought this helps get you there in terms of showing some of those steps or sub steps involved. So we won't walk through all of this, but at a high level, right, everything's driven by what's your strategic approach what's your end game right and what's the driving sort of precursor documents artifacts things that are driving your development effort so if we're talking from a cms measure developer perspective and more broadly in a lot of cases it's typically the meaningful measures initiative which is at 2.0 right now version um as you see in the top swim lane right and we're looking at okay so we bring in certain measure and literature review databases or tools uh, you see a few listed here, a quality positioning system that NQF has, CMS measures inventory, the MIDS library itself if you're a CMS MIDS developer. Lots of information to help drive that conceptualization process. It's clearly important, you know, what's your target alignment? Are you looking at certain settings or programs or uh, clinical care areas in addition to obviously disease specific or condition specific areas? And then what are some of the tools, the guiding processes and things around that, to, to Dan's earlier point of keeping in mind the down the road things, if you're thinking about, you know, NQF consensus-based endorsement, what do you need to be aware of and, and know upfront NQF criteria, um, things like that. Uh, obviously the blueprint if you're a CMS developer. This is some other artifacts that we've noted here is just being familiar with the NQF measure application partnership. What are, the, what are they saying? What's the trend? What's the sense there on those things going into this process? Those are good things to look at. So all of that kind of drives conceptual framework building and really getting to a list of concepts or measures of interest. Now, some of that, again, may be driven by a targeted contractual award or a grant or an agreement. But generally speaking, even on those items, you want to build this conceptual framework. You want to look at what are the high value characteristics I'm trying to attain through my measures and how do they fit into this framework? Um, obviously there's environmental scan, literature reviews, there's the measure scans that you can see feeding from the top, um, things like that. All of this to get to that potential candidate measure list or topics of interest. Some of it may drive, you may find that uh, uh, measure, maybe your initial set is broadened, maybe it's narrowed. Maybe you've narrowed down to, hey, I need to do some level of de novo development versus adapting or adopting or modifying or enhancing existing measures that are out there. Um, so moving to sort of the third swim lane, the business case or whatever you call it in your development process, if you're an external developer, you know, what's the bang for the buck of this measure? Um, so you've come up with these concepts uh, as part of that work in environmental scan and literature reviews and evidence gathering you start at that business case. You know, what's the performance gap? How big is it? Um, looking at all those things, looking at burden. Uh, so it's important, obviously, to develop that business case, look at the characteristics of the measure um, against some defined framework of characteristics, apply a ranking or a rating to see how the concept or concepts sort of uh, look. Um, ultimately, then, you're going to bring in your stakeholder engagement piece at the bottom here, whether the technical expert panels and uh, your patient and family and caregivers, important. I think we all do that, but uh, we want to make sure the focus is there. Ultimately, we're building measures uh, to help improve 
the quality of care, ultimately, the patient experience and outcomes. So you wanna try to follow some level of engaging patients, caregivers early and often, as well as your clinical and domain experts uh, as part of your tech. So typically you'll go through, you'll go through those reviews, you'll bring in those perspectives and you'll have an assessment or some kind of ranking of your business case. Where do you need to refine? What's sort of uh, got buy-in? Where do you need to kind of go back and maybe look at strengthening X, Y, or Z? Um, and ultimately, and again, in the case of CMS measure development, that lands on getting approval to move forward um, from our funder. So I think at a high level, we try to always use something like this to, to help us sort of work through that process. So next slide, please. So shifting gears a little bit, um, and back to some of what Dan touched on, I think practicality, right? And this is a balance. The next two slides really get on, are, are really interrelated here. But what I want to spend a few minutes on is um, that balance of trying to be you know, forward thinking and innovative with realistic expectations. Because, um, and we all wanna develop and get measures through a process as quickly as possible and shorten the development life cycle. That may be realistic in some cases, it may be less realistic in others. So I think to the point of being pragmatic, um, looking at if you're proposing uh, a budget and you're proposing a technical uh, approach to a number of measures, obviously the, the uh, factoring into that level of effort and cost need to be not just the number of measures, but the complexity to what Dan talked about a little bit earlier. I think sometimes we're overly ambitious in the sheer volume of measures that are proposed within the timeline we think we can do it and the budget. Um, and then we end up sort of, you know, being very challenged on the back end or throughout the development process. Again, some of this is dictated by your schedule of deliverables, your statement of work, what the funder has dictated in some cases, but not always. So I think you always want to kind of keep that in mind. Um, and really, regardless of funder, when it comes to the more complex measures that Dan hit on earlier, patient reported outcomes, composite measures, ECQM, some digital measures, uh, measures for non-patient facing specialty, radiologists, pathologists have their own inherent challenges, right? So in these cases, I think the development life cycle will often and inherently take longer. There's inherent sort of workflow or technical changes or considerations that you have to consider at the time you're early in the development process or even in the time you're thinking about how you're gonna fund this. Um, and they may not all be apparent or evident or within the control of the developer either as to Dan's earlier point. So um, again, I, I think not to lean too much on the complex measure side, but I think what I've always struggled with or been challenged by is acknowledgement that certain measure types have inherent current state feasibility challenges. You know before you get out and test them, they're in most cases not going to be feasible to the extent you would like them. But that's also part of the reason why you're trying to fill a gap. So when those situations arise, when you know there's going to be clinical, technical workflow or both involved to some extent, um, you want to make sure they're known and acknowledged early and communicated and have those discussions with your experts, your TEPs, your, your funder, your caregivers and families and patients around how, what their input is on helping some of that. The earlier you know these challenges, as Dan and we're going to allude to really over and over, I think, is the better you can plan mitigation. I think part of that early feasibility um, can even start in a preliminary workflow and technical feasibility assessment during the conceptualization phase. You're not going to get the detail that you're going to get when you're actually doing a full-blown feasibility analysis, but it'll give you at least an initial indication, hopefully, of the extent of what you may be faced with. So, um, and I think looking at the boil the ocean approach, I've touched on it a little bit here with the second bullet. I think sometimes we've seen, again, extreme variation in the number of measures we've supported from one uh, developer to another, or we ourselves may have, you know, overreached and said, hey, we can do 10 ECQMs in a two-year period. It's really not realistic in most cases. So keeping that in mind again, and that sort of boiling the ocean mentality, maybe figure out, can you scale down to a smaller set of high value, high impact measures 
with a realistic timeline that acknowledges constraints. That may be a better approach in certain cases. Um, I think the third bullet we hit on a little bit earlier, data, testing, vendors, HIT, again, especially in the ECQM cases, electronic measures, digital measures, the data becomes much more challenging. We'll get to that in a little more detail later. But I think it really gets to the point to really fully test an ECQM with the ultimate goal of NQF endorsement or inclusion in a national program. You really need early considerations and conversations with data vendors, HIT vendors, people who can help with that testing process. Um, and in some cases, you may want to have agreements with them early on as subcontractors or partners at the time of their proposals. Um, oftentimes, you may not be able to do that, but it's something we've found through a little bit of trial and error that, yeah, maybe it's better to sort of pay the piper, if you will, early rather than down the line when you're doing your test plan in, in the develop, in the, you know, a little further downstream in the development life cycle. And then lastly, at times, it may be beneficial to divide your development process into two phases, if you will. And the first is really to get a measure established. Oftentimes, we try to go, I think, from no outcome measure to full-blown patient-reported outcome performance measure, as an example, with no sort of middle or intermediate outcome, or I hate to say it, the dreaded process measure in the middle. And sometimes I think you need to have that building block measure, to, as the name implies, right, build upon. So if, if you need to get make those small incremental gains and build it out as more data comes in through the process that's been established and whatever workflow was needed, you may be in a better position to actually make that transition to a, a, an outcome-driven measure. Sometimes you can go from nothing to outcome. Other times it's more challenging than I think uh, sometimes we realize. So I think in the coming slides, um, we talk a little bit more about some of the additional challenges and mitigations in the early phases. But if you could go to the um, next slide, I think it, it dovetails a little bit from what we've just talked about, right? Um, the return on investment. Everybody wants to have a bang for the buck, right? We're not developing measures just to develop measures as, as for experience, right? We really want to make a difference. We really want to make an impact. And that impact needs to be measured by some return on investment, right? And I think at times, uh, the return on investment may not be realized, but it's also nuanced. And I think if, if a measure, quote unquote, fails, does it mean that ultimately the measure development project was a failure? If the measure or measures created aren't, aren't fully embraced and adopted right out of the chute? Not necessarily, right? I think it depends. And I think by that, I mean, we want every concept we come up with, every measure developed to be successful back to the value add piece, to the patient, to the provider, to the funder. Um, but that ROI determination may be one that sometimes is beyond dollars and cents. I think it's not necessarily a binary on off, yes, no. I think we also have to consider whether the development time originally envisioned was as realistic as we thought it was. You know, can we take some lessons learned and translate that going forward kind of thing? Were there external constraints we didn't realize maybe at the time of the award or the start of this that we can learn from? Um, and again, I think it's especially important when you're trying to tackle a significant measure or specialty gap area or subspecialty gap um, because these challenges are real and they will come up. So I think from, from these perspectives, the question of RI, RI Oh, um, all right, I can't speak today. <laughs> Return on investment really, and the definition of success, quote unquote, versus failure becomes blurred, as you really need to consider the expectations at the start, uh, whether any of the constraints, unknowns, roadblocks, all these things that we sometimes come up against, uh, you know, how did they impact that? Um, and, and then that really gets you a better you know, more combo of qualitative, quantitative assessment of the return on investment. Um, and again, the, the second bullet here really is talking about that as well. If you're going to fail in term measure development speak, you want to do that early enough where you can either uh, shift the workflow and gain the feasibility that's needed. There may be cases something's not feasible currently, 
But there's some moderate or not so major changes that need to be done, and it's worth it. You know, do you throw the baby out with the bathwater because current state feasibility isn't there, or do you work for the broader, longer-term goal kind of thing? So I think those are um, a few of the areas I wanted to hit on in terms of the ROI and the realistic expectations piece before moving on to the next slide. I think on this one, we're going to shift back to Dan. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so as Mike said, we're really diving into the stage-specific challenges and mitigations here. So this next challenge involves ma making sure that measures fill real measurement gaps. And I think this dovetails nicely with uh, Mike's discussion earlier about the return on investment, making sure we're actually you know, measuring, quantifying known pressing issues. Um, so one way to do this, especially in the CMS development context, is by leveraging the Meaningful Measures Framework. I could tell you just by way of an example uh, that way, that when I led a measure development project where we were creating new measures for an existing quality rating system, we created a framework where we mapped the existing measures in the program to the meaningful measures categories. That way we could kind of uh, visually determine gaps that could be filled by either adapted or de novo measures. This was helpful not only for me and the project team, but it, it really I think helps with the stakeholders and the technical expert panel so they can really see concretely where to focus, where we should be focusing our development efforts and help guide us that way. Uh, I point out it's also critically important to make sure that environmental scans are comprehensive and uh, then are identifying potentially competing measures early. And I, I know we all know how to do environmental scans and scan the literature and whatnot, but you know, really taking a, a deep dive and thinking out of the box is important, using all the tools that are at our disposal, and, and Mike already discussed some of them. You know, for example, the CMS Measures Inventory Tool or CMIT. That's your friend. It's important not just to kind of know about and use this tool, but also to stay on top of it because CMS and um, Patel, as the MMS contractor, they update these regularly. They really help to get a better picture of who's developing what, what's been done, what's currently underway, that kind of thing. Um, above and beyond that, and you know, we're going to be talking about this more, you know, communication, cooperation, and transparency across measure developers is really essential to success. You know, having conversations and sharing information openly can help identify measures that other contractors or developers are looking at. They might still be in their pipeline or early in the development phase, so they wouldn't normally come up on any of the, the tools. So as a best practice, measure developers should really be talking with each other and not relying on only on what's you know in the published or public domain. Just lastly, as part of you know, conceptualization, um, it's, it's critically important for developers to be able to articulate early in the process what the potential impacts of their measures would be. That could be in terms of cost, lives saved, et cetera. Um, I'd refer everyone to the business case template. You know, this is a really important tool. It's required for CMS measure developers, so we all, we all um, have to use it, I, but I recommend it for all, as it really helps it, it's really a useful too to help frame the measures in port and as well as the gaps it's filling. So, uh, next slide. I'm just think I'll, we're going back to Mike for a slide. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, so I, I, I want to talk a little bit about quote unquote digital measures, right? As you see here, and really, um, and the reason why we've included digital measures on a sort of uh, quality improvement slide, right? And, no brainer here. Quality, any quality measure we develop to what we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, should support some defined quality improvement. Shouldn't be a checkbox. Shouldn't be something that um, is going to be implemented just because it has to get implemented because it's required for a program, right? It should have some true meaning and, and outcome here, um, and quality improvement around that. Uh, so, from a digital measures perspective, the reason why we're emphasizing digital measures here is I think. Most of the audience is aware of the push by the government for quote unquote digital measures. And it's been uh, an ambitious and aggressive timeline that's now uh, looking at the CMS measure port measurement portfolio, portfolio to be digitized by 2025, which is what, three and a half years, not even. Um, so let's take a step back first, right? And think about, well, what do we mean when we say digital measures? So. I think, so what are they in terms of definition? And it's, it's an important question that I wanted to spend a minute or two on here because I think it can, it can vary depending upon someone's perspective at the high level, right? And this very topic came up 
and there was some confusion around that a recent NQS TEP that I was part of about patient reported outcomes and trying to think about digital measures through that lens. So I think it's a valid question, and, it, and it, again, it's critical. It's a critical question because of that aggressive and ambitious timeline. So from my perspective, a couple of things to keep in mind around digital measures, digital quality measures, DQMs. Um, it's part of the Meaningful Measures 2.0 initiative, all right? It, it's defined by CMS as that. Um, and it's defined as measures which originate from sources of health information that, as the name implies, really, are captured and can be transmitted electronically and via interoperable systems. Now, that's a big ask, right, from where we are today and where we've all been working to get to. But that, that's the definition. And I think um, there is also a report NCQA, National Committee for Quality Assurance, released, uh, I think, back in May of this year, uh, recommending CMS continue that push for digital measures and eliminating redundancy in implementation and reporting, right? Again, I think that the, both saying the same thing ultimately, which is trying to get to a future state, which is one where we, that mantra of capture the data once, report it multiple times, instead of where we are sometimes today is capture it, the same concept for one program, uh, two programs, three programs, and report it three different times with three varying sets of requirements kind of thing. So um, in that same report, NCQA applauds the 2025 timeline and provides their example of a de definition of a digital measure as one that's derived from digital resources such as EHRs, um, health information exchanges, clinical registries. So I think, you know, when you think about those two statements or the way it's defined, it really is the same thing. Um, we're talking about stuff that can be at some point in time by 2025, more plug and play, more less manual and more automated work through these other data sources. And again, I think uh, in talking about well, how do we get there, I think a big driver of that push for digital measures will continue to be the use of evolving HL7 standards for those of you who are in that space. Fast healthcare interoperability resources or FHIR are a big driver to a number of things, including uh, the future state of uh, electronic clinical quality measures or digital measures from a CMS perspective and the APIs that go along with that. Again, to allow clinicians, to allow facilities to submit information one time, but it be used in many ways. So I think we're going to put a few links either in the chat, if we haven't already, around where some of these uh, the reports are and the link to meaningful measures 2.0 etc um, and then i think you know obviously in terms of uh, digital measures and the relationship to better care coordination and better quality improvement at the point of care and how there's a uh, better communication between providers it can all sort of uh, flow from that as opposed to your your standard claims-based measures or, or other measures I think um, there's also information, and if we don't have the link here, we could probably add it. Um, there is uh, another NQF report that was released re relatively recently around leveraging EHR sourced measures to improve care communication, care coordination and communication. And I think in some of that report, there are some examples that might be helpful to people. Again, not to be prescriptive, but things to keep in mind in terms of, you know, how, how can I, how can I better get from measures that really drive quality improvement, drive improved coordination and communication between providers, patients, clinicians, et cetera? And I think I will turn it back to Dan for the next slide on specification. Uh, thanks, Mike. So aligning or adapting measures um, when similar or competing measures are identified is, obviously, is a known challenge as well. Um, the biggest mitigation of this issue we found, again, is collaboration and coordination. So I, I did warn you that this would be a theme. This, back, this best practice is challenging for multiple reasons, so I don't want to sugarcoat it, but, you know, the first challenge is developers have an inherent vested interest in um, in their measures, including making sure that they get credit for it and that their vision isn't compromised, and that's you know just understandable in the work we do. Uh, the second challenge is you know coordination by definition is going to require an additional level of effort on top of everybody's already high demand. Um, so you know we want to acknowledge those challenges. That said, uh, we have seen this done effectively 
and we participated in these exercises in our in our own measure development efforts. Um, we have a we have a bunch of examples, but in the interest of time, I think I'm just going to provide one. If time allows, later we can discuss. But um, the example I provide is when, when Mike and I both worked together at another company uh, before Rely, we were um, we were developing new measures for qualified health plans, and we discovered that you know, we, along with our subcontractor, were developing a measure of adverse drug events for diabetic patients that was also being pursued at the same time by a, a third entity. So thankfully, we already had a good working relationship with these between the three of us, the three entities. So. Um, you know, we got the we talked with and got the approval of CMS and determined that the best course forward would be if we all developed the three of us developed the measure in partnership. That way, we'd be able to actually leverage the the data set that each group had, and as well as tap into the various stakeholder perspectives that the entities had access to. So, uh, you know, in this process, we worked with we talked with and worked with NQF to identify the the hurdles that would be you know might be encountered in this kind of scenario. Um, you know, with the endorsement process and, and after, you know, we identified, you know, as an example, stewardship, you know, ongoing stewardship of this measure might be something to consider and work through. Um, once those kind of challenges and issues were worked out and everybody was in agreement, uh, creating a memorandum of understanding is what we did, kind of making sure that the, all the entities were in agreement and on the same page and, you know, kind of protected. Um, to be sure, you know, none of this sounds, none of this happens overnight. Uh, but the point is that it's possible, and it starts with the coordination, collaboration. Um, we'd advise, you know, um, you know, when developers are developing measures that are, you know, in known high priority gap areas, you know, we think that the odds of this um, scenario increase. So, you know, our, our advice based on our experience is probably be the following. Um, first is to make sure you go through proper channels, right? Like consult for us, it's consulting with CMS or, or whoever the funder might be, making sure um, that we get there. Uh, approval to go forth with this kind of arrangement. Um, you know, it might be just uh, blessings from within your own organization, um, and also asking for legal advice if necessary. Um, we also asked and received really good assistance throughout this process. So for us, we had CMS and NQF as partners, and that was critical to making sure this was successful. Um, we'd also advise that you know keeping the end goal in mind um, is important. In this case, you know. And in most cases, you should be getting the best in-class measure to the market, not necessarily putting your flag flag down and saying, this is our measure. Um, and again, you know, going back to project management, um, as I said, this isn't this doesn't happen overnight. So in, during the project management, you got to consider the time it might take for establishing this kind of arrangement um, as early as the conceptualization stage when you realize that competing measures have been identified. Next slide. I know I'm going. I know I'm going long here. So um, uh, this challenge really gets again gets at uh, constraints and timelines. Sometimes often outside the control of the measure developer. I'll I'll, I'll I'll go through this relatively quickly because I think I and Mike have touched on this. But you know, in digital measures especially, there's an active ecosystem of people creating and adapting standards. Well, you know, while this is exciting, as the, all of these collective efforts get us closer to interoperable data and better measurement. The timelines don't always necessarily align with developers, so you know we recommend that all developers, um, especially those planning to or actively developing digital measures, be active users of the ECQRI Resource Center as well as following H HL7 activities, um, especially the you know the relevant or applicable standards work group. This provides a better understanding of anticipated standards um, adoptions or changes that might be coming. Um, and again, I won't. Going into depth on this, you know, we acknowledge that going through, uh, you know, going through and filling out the complete feasibility scorecard in the first year might be un unrealistic unless you have data already, you know, good quality data already available. But you know, the the feasibility assessment, as Mike touched on, has to start early and continue throughout. Um, and you know, those discussions, early discussions, and considerations of, you know, what is the current state versus the the state needed to support the measures. I think you can skip to the next slide. Okay, risk adjustment and stratification. This can be a challenge. This can be an area fraught with challenges. Um, you know, we can't. We could spend a whole session just talking about this. But you know, much of the guidance really talks about you know consulting with a statistician, a statistician, you know, for risk adjustment and stratification. But there are also some you know approaches that people that aren't statisticians, measure developers, can use to help shape their the approach to risk adjustment, um, or at least enrich the conversation with the consultant statisticians. First thing is really considering whether risk adjustment is necessary. Uh, to answer these questions, um, developers should be thinking critically about the ultimate goal of the measure. You know, 
if it's intended for a pay for performance program, then risk adjustment might be more favorable than if it's for public reporting or transparency purposes alone. Hybrid approaches can also be considered, and you know this is discussed in the risk adjustment supplement to the blueprint, so I won't go into depth on it. Uh, now, another thing is to consider the risk of explaining away important quality issues. You know, just for example, because just because a socially disadvantaged group has demonstrably or historically worse outcomes, that doesn't you know that may not in itself warrant risk adjustment. That might um, obscure uh, issues at the provider level when they're if they're not addressing root causes that could be or should be addressed. Obviously, this needs to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis based on stakeholder input, statistics, and you know, be balanced with the program goals and discussed with CMS and funders, what have you, but we're putting it out there. Um, conceptual models are useful, and you know, they can really help explain, you know, examine the causal pathway to outcomes. Um, along those same lines, developing the conceptual model might help also help inform which, um, which variables should be included in a risk adjustment model. You know, often... Often the approach is to look at which variables are statistically significantly associated with the outcome, you know. But another approach might be to consult with the stakeholders, clinicians, with me to determine which variables are likely clinically meaningful uh, associated or have a, you know, to have a more parsimonious model, not necessarily just driven on uh, p-values. Stratification can be an alternative or a supplement to risk adjustment. You know, a benefit of stratification is that it potentially gives audiences more information. You know, for example. A patient might be interested in drilling down to determine uh, performance of a provider related to people that are like them on variables. That, you know, that might be obscured by a risk adjustment model, so that might be worth considering too. Um, similarly, I would say stratification can really help um, in the quality improvement context to help drill down and determine if there are certain uh, pockets of the population that you need to do a better job on. Um, uh, lastly, I would say on this, you know, Developers should cons consistently re-examine how they're operationalizing the risk adjustment model and the variables. You know, just as an example, this is coming from the gerontologist, um, age is a variable used often in risk adjustment models, and certainly that makes sense. It's an important variable, but you know, other variables that get at biological age, something like uh, frailty, you know, biological age versus chronological age, this could be considered and tested to provide, you know, determine if it could provide more precision if we're really what we're really interested in looking at ages identifying underlying risks in the models next slide please so this this next challenge really comes from the fact that there's much more focus on assessing equity and social determinants of health I think it, you know it's great and I'm sure well received by the audience here but you know unfortunately like in many situations the the tools for addressing these concepts are somewhat lacking uh, but they are evolving thankfully um, you know I put here the Healthy People 2030 goal, and I think that you know measures can be a very critical uh, part of meeting this goal to address equity. Measure developers can consider kind of that next level measurement development techniques to you know to, to have these ideas in mind, even if they're not folks you know even if equity or social determinants of health isn't the focus of the measure. Just as an example, you know measure developers could be making sure that the the measure data can be used at the individual provider and population levels down the road. They might also coordinate with social service providers to identify data nuances. Um, or, you know, if a measure developer is between two data sources, working with those social service providers, they might decide that it's best to opt for the one that's known or used by the providers that, you know, that would increase the utility and help help look across the continuum. Next slide. I think I'm handing it off to you, Mike, on this one. Yeah, thank you. And in the interest of time, I think we have hit on a number of these items or at least touched on them initially. And I think you guys have probably all experienced this to varying degrees. Obviously, if you're a registry, if you're developing registry measures and you have access to a QCDR or a clinical data registry within your purview, the lack of data for testing becomes a little less challenging, but you still have to make sure that the, the robustness of that testing is going to meet the criteria or the program requirements for you know, where it's going, if it's gone to NQF, or even if it's not gone to NQF, but it's gone in proposed for a given program as we talked about earlier. And I think that the biggest challenge I've experienced in testing, and again, this is coming a little bit from a CMS contractual measure developer and doing electronic clinical quality measures is where do I get the data? Who will work with me, EHR vendors, HIT vendors, clinical practice sites, facilities? And that is a huge challenge through from that perspective. Um, and I'll skip to the last bullet because understanding those costs and what that really takes if you have to go that route is oftentimes not funded 
to the extent that it needs to be, or we kind of tend to gloss over it and we sort of kick the can down the road. And we'll work out agreements with test sites or practice sites or vendors eh, right before we start alpha testing or feasibility testing. It doesn't work very well in actuality. So if you can move that upstream and even enter into agreements with these entities as part of your proposal, you may have a better shot because they're in it from the beginning and they have a, you know, more skin in the game as well. Of course, there's budgetary implications, as we said. I think it highlights the relationship and the need for leveraging their stakeholders and your relationships and your rapport um, to do so. But um, there's lots more, as, as Dan said, we could probably spend an hour on each of these topics individually. But next slide, I think we, we sort of talk a little bit more about the early engagement piece, um, talked about phased approach, building block measures a little bit earlier, so I won't spend a lot of time on that here. Um, we did see one question, I think, come in um, around, can you ensure, or what tips might we have for improving the, the potential success for submitting measures to CMS on the muck list, I believe? And I think that's a nuanced question, right? I think the most important thing is, right, is building the time into your timeline, making sure you're not scrambling at the 11th hour to pull all the information together. What I would say is, uh, from, from just a high-level perspective, is all the documentation you need to submit to the MUC list, to submit eventually to NQF if you're going that path, should by and large be a byproduct of your predecessor cycles. So you shouldn't be reinventing the wheel, so to speak. Um, and, and maybe that helps in terms of just the information you have to gather and compile. If you could kind of make sure your, your artifacts coming out of the earlier phases are geared that way, at least logistically, you'll be in a better spot. I think the other thing I would say is if you have some nuanced measure, whether it's a non-patient facing, patient facing measure that you're trying to get into MIPS, or it's a complex measure that's on the cutting edge of where the standards are from an HL7 perspective. Try to work with your funder and have the conversations with the, the whether it's the CMS uh, leaders uh, who run the MUC list or the QPP, if you're going down that path, or whether it's some external entity that ultimately is gonna yay or nay the measure, try to get out in front of those discussions. It's not always easy, but that's the best thing because the last thing you want is to somebody to see a measure that's inherently complex on the muck list for the first time and have no real insight into what you're trying to do, even though there's a ton of muck list information there. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I, I thought that might be um, something, a couple of things to think about. And I think that was the end of the testing uh, slide. Thank you so much. Uh, so just for folks here, you can see some of the resources um, that we have in place for measure developers. Um, so obviously all of the information that you, uh, that the Relay team went through today, um, you can find best practices in the blueprint, of course, and there's a link on that uh, on the page and also in the chat. Um, and then of course, um, NQF uh, and then the CMS quality measures website are available to you. Um, you know, and for folks that have questions, you know, follow up on uh, Mike's response regarding the uh, muck list process, you can always reach out to the MMS team. Um, we help do some of the coordination of the muck list using the CMS merit tool at MMS support um, at epitel.org. Uh, and you can reach out to us there. Um, the Q&A is still open, but I don't see any right now. So while we're waiting for those to come in, can we go to the next slide? And I'll just go through a few announcements here. So this is a really big announcement. Um, just earlier this week, Blueprint version 17 was released. Uh, so when you go to the MMS website and go to the Blueprint page, uh, all of those materials are going to be those that were just updated. Uh, so there are a handful of changes. Um, so one of the big ones is a new supplemental material um, that this Relay team helped us to develop, uh, which is on the topic of population health measures. There is a substantially revised business case form and then instructions related to completing that. Um, there is, again, additional information related to kind of special uh, considerations 
for measures that are focused on the Medicaid population rather than the Medicare population, some new reliability content, so information on um, you know, what we're looking for when we talk about reliability testing, and then of course information about the new MUC process that was rolled out earlier this year, uh, and information on the merit tool. So if you didn't submit a measure this year uh, and are thinking about it next year, then that'll be really handy information for you to have. Go to the next slide. Uh, and then in case you missed it, our August info session was uh, specifically on measure specifications. Uh, and so you can now see that presentation on the CMS YouTube page. Feel free to take a look or share it with your colleagues. Uh, and then in October, we're going to do our next info session on that new population health measurement topic, uh, sort of echoing some of the lessons from the new supplemental material that's in version 17 of the blueprint. So, um, with that, let me see, it looks like a question just came through. Ah, okay, so for the Relay team, uh, one of our attendees asks, can you share some information about general validity testing for the measures and the artifacts that could be produced from the validity testing process? That's, I know we only have three minutes left, but while we're here, if you have a quick answer. Hey, it's Mike. So I think, you know, th there's a lot of information about the types of validity testing and whatnot, I think, in the blueprint. Uh, one thing to avoid is just doing face validity, right? You want to make sure that obviously you have that buy-in with the face validity, but then when you're actually trying to look at reliability and validity of the measure that you're doing additional statistical tests and you have the data to do so, right? So we could probably provide a few uh, follow-ups offline if you want to shoot something to us but I, I think it's a valid question um there are statistical tests it sort of depends on you know which test you apply and which level of analysis you do may depend on on a specific circumstance but there is some general you know information we can provide and thoughts like that dan from your perspective anything to add no, I, I, I wouldn't. I, I think you hit it on it, Mike. I think you, usually the constraint is the data that's available. I think that's really where the, uh, the the statisticians and the measure developers really can work hand in hand to figure out what's what's possible to determine. You know, usually this is being done kind of before a measure is implemented, so it's kind of often cart for the horse in some cases. So you have to be creative. I know we certainly had to be on the health plan, you know, qualified health plan um, project. Thank you both. And that takes us pretty much to the top of the hour. So with that, you have my contact information here on this slide. You can always reach out to me or that MMS support. If you have any follow-up questions about the presentation today, uh, and if not, then we look forward to uh, talking with you again next month. And thank you again to the Relay team, uh, Mike Rapp and Dan Anderson for presenting today. Really appreciate it. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.